Later on. Welcome to the May 2024 W3C WebRTC Working Group meeting. Next slide. We abide by the W3C patent policy as described at the link and only in people companies listed on the status link are allowed to make substantive contributions. Next slide. So today we're gonna to talk about captured surface control, encoder transform, media capture main, peer-to-peer -peer API and RTP transport. We have two more meetings this summer in June and July. We'll usually take off for vacations in August and then in September we'll have TPAC and we'll announce the agenda for that uh, in upcoming weeks. Next slide. All right, uh, the slides are up on the wiki as usual. Do we have a scribe? I think Dom is out today. Uh, Karine, are, are you, can you scribe or is someone else gonna volunteer? Uh, yes, I can try. Thank you, Karine. Okay, uh, as usual, the meeting's being recorded and will be public. Next slide. The meeting operates under the W3C Code of Ethics and Professional Conduct. So while we're all passionate, let's keep it cordial and professional. Next. So I think you all know how to use it, but uh, Google Meet, but basically raise your hand if you wanna get into the queue and the uh, people running the sessions will, will manage that and then lower your hand to get out of the queue and tell us who you are in case we don't know so that we can, for the notes, um, and uh, use a headset. Thank you. Next. Okay, uh, just because something's a document uh, in a repo doesn't mean it's been adopted. That's a separate process. We use the call for adoption and editor's drafts also don't imply consensus. Um, anyway, I think everyone knows this. Next slide. All right, so this is the agenda for today, as we mentioned. Uh, we're going to turn it over to a lot, and then we have encoder transform, media capture main, and, and the rest of the agenda. It is going to be a little bit tight, um, so we're going to try to uh, keep to that and, and not go over the guidelines. So, a lot. You have the floor till eight forty a.m. Thank you. Uh, so, I'm going to present today about captured surface control. It's an API that's currently in origin trial in Chrome, and uh, we hope that uh, you will like it and that you will choose to. Uh, Adopt it. Uh, let's start with the problem description, right? So at the moment, I'm sharing a tab and I'm in a video call. And if I wanted to change the uh, zoom level of the tab that I was sharing or to scroll it to uh, reveal more pixels further down the line, um, I would have to switch over to the other tab, do that, then go back. And I might have to do that many, many times during the call. And that might be a little bit annoying. And what I could do instead is I could just focus the other tab and then I would lose access to a lot of the things that are inside of the video conferencing tool itself, right? Like pictures of everybody else, a comprehensive list of all, of, uh, all other participants, chat messages, emoji reactions, any kind of thing, maybe a timer, maybe speaker notes, everything that you would normally build into a video conferencing tool. So I've got this tension where I actually want to be in two different things at the same time. And I might be able to resolve that if I just place my windows side by side, but I can't always do that because sometimes I just want to use all of my screen real estate for one or the other. So what we propose here is an API that would allow a web application like Meet or Zoom or Teams or any of those uh, to basically improve the screen sharing uh, experience by allowing you to do specific actions, only zooming and scrolling directly from inside of the video conferencing tool. And very explicitly, we do not intend for this to be extended further. Uh, we do not extend, uh, intend for left clicks or we don't intend you to be able to deliver keyboard events, only scrolling and zooming are intended with this particular API shape. Now, because this is already an origin trial, I am actually able to just show you a demonstration of this in action. So please bear with me as I uh, try this. Here we go. Um, so what you see here is me inside of another Meet call, sorry for the inception. Uh, and I'm screen sharing another tab. 
about recursion. And you can see that normally I could just go to the other tab and I could interact directly with the browser to change the zoom level or to scroll. But with this, what you saw just here was I interacted with the video conferencing tool. I gave the permission and now I'm scrolling the shared tab directly from inside of me. And you can see that I can even change the zoom level. And in the bottom right, you might have seen uh, there was, let me jump here again. There was actually uh, an indicator telling me what the zoom level on the other tab was, and I was able to change that. And I was able to change that with zoom in, zoom out, but you could have also had a drop down list of all uh, supported, um, all supported um, zoom levels if we wanted. Sorry about that. Let me try to skip past this so you don't see it another time. Okay, so uh, what does the API shape look like? Um, I think that instead of just giving you a list of all of the uh, functions, I could just walk you through one way to use the API. So it's going to have four steps. Let's start. Step number one, or let's say step number zero, is you start the, you prompt the user to share, and the user chooses a tab. And if the user did not choose a tab, none of the other steps matter. So never mind. Step number one is that you check whether you've got permission from a previous invocation of this API. If you do, great, skip to the next step. Otherwise, you can in, uh, induce the browser to prompt the user by doing a no op kind of call. In this case, I'm just using the uh, sending uh, a mouse wheel event where basically I scroll for zero. We can cover that later. But basically, the first time you do that, uh, you're going to get a promise. The uh, browser is going to prompt the user. And if the user ever says allow, the promise is uh, uh, settled. And otherwise, uh, the, uh, prom uh, the prom if the user blocks, it's rejected, et cetera, normal stuff. Now, uh, let's go to zoom in, OK? That's going to be uh, step number two and three. Uh, you can see that normally browsers allow you to interact with the browser itself and change the zoom level of the tab. Uh, and you, what we want to do here is introduce uh, programmatic control of that. So first, we've got uh, read access, right? And read, uh, read access is done with just you call get zoom level, and you get a number. The number is between zero and infinity, and it represents basically a uh, percentage. So basically, the default zoom would be 100, and that's it. And you can uh, show that to the user directly if you want, as this example does. Uh, the next step is we also want to allow the user to uh, reduce and increase the zoom level, and that is done with get zoom level. Uh, the code here is a bit elaborate, but basically the idea is that any browser supports a number of zoom levels that are kind of natural, right? Because when you you don't you you cannot set any zoom level. There are certain zoom levels that have been allow listed by the browser, and we just get a list of those as get supported zoom levels. And we just make sure that when the user clicks uh, increase zoom, we just jump or attempt to jump to the next zoom level by calling get zoom level of that. And uh, last, we want to be able to scroll. Uh, you could show the user something like that. This is just a mock, right? Where you explain to the user, hey, if you scroll over the preview, we're actually going to scroll whatever you're sharing. That's just one way to do that. And the way that you would do this with our API is that you would basically listen for scroll events over your preview time. You're going to calculate the offset, right? Like, OK, this was 25% in and you know 75% down. And you're going to uh, basically translate that from the space of the video preview tile of your application to the space of the, uh, to the coordinate space of the frames, which might be the same or might be different. It depends on how your application uh, decides to use the preview time. And that's it. You deliver the location, x and y. You deliver the scroll deltas, again, x and y. And uh, that's it. You call send will, and that happens. And that was my uh, that was the API. I did not go into all of the tiny little details because this is the we've not spoken about this API in a while. So I thought uh, that the high level discussion was useful first. So what do you think? I'm not a.
UX designer, but as a user, I would think that this would make it so I could do like half of the things that I would want to do, but then I would suddenly realize I can't do the other half. You know, if I'm presenting slides, for example, I'll be like, awesome, I can scroll, but then I can't change the slide by clicking. So it's like half a solution. Does that, does that make uh, sense? So yeah, definitely. And uh, definitely a concern that has be ra been raised, but I would say two things. Uh, first, the specific example that you gave was of uh, slides. At least with uh, slides, this works, right? Like if you scroll, that is actually interpreted as changing the slides. Uh, but definitely you're right that other things would be impossible, like maybe starting to play video. And that's something that users unfortunately uh, need to, uh, to learn. Uh, I think that they learn it pretty quickly, that only some things are possible. And um, that is uh, an unfortunate piece of reality that we can only have some of the things we want. Yes, Anibar? You muted. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, so, so, yes, so I think uh, what you showed is useful, but. Uh... To what Peter mentioned, I would definitely push back on going any further than this because that seems to be inviting. Uh, well, I should say the screen capture spec already has uh, in its explainer part of its non goals is to do remote assistance because that opens up a whole of uh, security issues where someone could, you know, uh, maliciously. Uh, uh, Trick my, you know, my my parents into uh, entering credit card numbers and doing things remotely on their system to uh, do all kinds of remote attacks. So, but as to what you showed, I think uh, the use case is uh, appealing. I guess my first question would be whether the user agent might be in a better position to do these same things uh, without letting the application uh, do these things. Because it is touch, it's getting closer to remotely controlling the user's content, which is a bit, uh, in the sense that you can imagine <clears throat> a nice application would just use this as intended for the presenter to be able to access their same page uh, from a different tab, and that doesn't seem troublesome at all. But you could also imagine uh, an application letting the remote viewer scroll around the, the person's page, which might be. A little bit more nefarious in that, uh, let's say I'm sharing, you know, uh, some of my summer photos, and unbeknownst to me, the viewer could then scroll ahead and scroll down and look at different pictures and giggle, and I don't know what's going on, because I'm sharing more than what is obvious, and all this relies on people reading permission prompts uh, very uh, carefully, and, and we we kind of know that a lot of users they don't really read the text and permission prompts. So I do have some concerns with this, uh, but I do support, I think it's a use case worth uh, exploring. Um, so first of all, thank you very much and let the minutes show that you do support the uh, use case. Um, so a couple of uh, things there. Uh, number one, uh, letting the browser take uh, control of this instead of giving this to the application. Uh, is easier in the case of Zoom than it is of, in scrolling, and even then it's not ideal. So we could imagine that the application could ask the uh, browser to show certain UX, or the, maybe the browser always shows that UX, uh, but that UX is not, would then not be integrated into the web application. And in our experience, it's very difficult for, uh, for the browser to put uh, those controls in a place that's both unintrusive as well as discoverable, whereas the application uh, can always take care of that. And different applications can uh, solve that problem in different ways uh, that fit them better. Uh, so, and for scrolling, this is actually um, more complicated, right? Because uh, scrolling is not actually very well defined in that you, you don't actually page up and page down, but rather you deliver a scroll event over something and that is then interpreted by the captured application in a way that might be uh, analogous to scrolling, but it could be anything else, right? So for example, Google Maps uh, zooms in and out. Uh, Apple's uh, website often shows uh, very elaborate animations when you scroll and it interleaves actual scrolling with those animations. Uh, and uh, best case of all is, uh, sorry, uh, 
most convincing case of all is that you could have multiple different scroll bars. So allowing, uh, giving this to the application actually allows the application to expose this as you scroll over the preview and that gets translated into a scroll in the right position. Now you could say that this could be mediated by the browser, but by then it becomes very complicated. Whereas here, even though uh, it was a bit of code, uh, I think it's you know the amount an amount of code that you could read within one minute and understand it fully. So it's not very complicated. And if you were to try to give this to the application uh, to the browser, uh, you're going to run into a lot of edge cases with making sure that this does not overlap the wrong thing. Uh, which could still, you know, be misused and um, basically um, uh, the complexity there is uh, very significant. Uh, yes, Peter, sorry, I don't want you to um, to forget what you want to say, so I'll break off here. Oh, so it, maybe I'm understanding better now what this means. Uh, the application, the JavaScript can control the scrolling, basically, of another tab? That's correct. So does that mean when I trust the application or the JavaScript with this permission, that means it could theoretically scroll all over the place on the web page in ways that I don't even, not even know the web page will react and then capture things? I'm, I'm, I'm not just trusting it to see what I'm currently looking at. I'm trusting it to see anything that it could possibly see with any scrolling event, and I don't even know what that, how the web page it can control now with the scrolling events might react. Absolutely. Okay, so uh, and, I, and I'm just wondering if users are going to understand the implications of that, right? Yes. Um, I, I want to just uh, point out something, uh, two things. Uh, first of all, yes, you are correct uh, in that, uh, and that needs to be stated. Uh, mitigating this is a that you no, don't normally start uh, screen sharing with just any random web application. Most users uh, do that in a context that makes sense. Otherwise, they're already in trouble. Uh, second is that there is a secondary uh, user prompt here, which further um, discourages abuse. And third is that uh, browsers are will be encouraged to employ their own kind of UX to explain to the user what's going on. If we look specifically at Chrome's current implementation, let me just get back to the video, then you can see that at the moment, uh, there is this extra indicator saying, saying shared tabs can be scrolled and zoomed, and clicking that would actually take you to the place where you can revoke that permission. So uh, that's what we're currently experimenting with, but of course other browsers could employ other means. I think Yanivar is first. Oh, no, I'll let you go first. Okay. Um, yes, um, we we already talked about that in a in a past address meeting, but um, uh, I wonder whether trying to do more integration between the user agent and the web application uh, would be a, a solution to not do prompting because prompting is hard and uh, and the question here is hard to understand and um, so with media element there are some uh, controls that the user agent can show and that allows the user to actually uh, play pose and do things like uh, go to full screen and so on it, it's not uh, some web developers use it some web developers prefer to set the controls to off and re-implement their own controls so that it's better designed. Um, but maybe here there would be a way where we could try to mix a little bit the, the two approach, meaning you, you have like native controls that are somehow uh, CSS customiz customizable or something like that, like a, a hybrid approach between the, the prompt based and the, the media controls one. And maybe that would help uh, removing the uh, permission issue. Um, I would be slightly more open to that in the case of scrolling, where I think it kind of makes sense uh, because the preview needs to be shown and the user interacts with the preview. Uh, for Zoom, I would be a bit uh, less uh, open to that because I want applications to have the 
uh, flexibility to put those controls wherever they want. And I think that uh, it's a lot easier for the user to understand uh, that, you know, what Zoom means and what the ramifications are. Um, maybe so somehow uh, when you have um, text tracks, uh, the media element is being rendered and the text, the CSS applied to the text track is done by the user agent and is user agent specific because uh, the user agent knows the user, maybe the user wants that or uh, needs bigger fonts and so on. So the user agent is, is doing the rendering of uh, the text tracks on top of the media element. And may maybe uh, this idea could be somehow reused there so that you could get some kind of integration but still knowing that uh, that's the user agent that receives uh, input and the web application is just helping a little bit and integrating a little bit to, to get things nicer. Um, I understand what the benefits of this approach would be, but I think they're not significantly uh, balanced against the cost of limiting uh, the UX uh, decisions of applications and uh, basically creating something that is potentially clashing between the overall UX language of the application and whatever controls happen to be implemented, the, the way the controls are implemented in any given browser. Now with scrolling, that's not a concern. So I'm more open to that. And also I uh, concede that scrolling sounds a bit scarier than zooming. So that's why I think it would be more interesting to discuss that, that there. Uh, full disclosure, I'm still for allowing the application to have control of uh, scrolling too, but I think it makes more sense uh, to um, split this discussion between uh, scrolling and zooming. And just a different feedback. Uh, it, it would be nice if it, it seems to only focus on uh, user user agent tabs but I, I could see windows and even screens like you you can you can zoom screens and you, you can zoom uh windows as well so there it might be also of, of some use so if we would go down with such uh api surfaces we would need to be sure that we would applic uh, that we, they would be applicable and very easy to use uh, for windows and screens as well uh, definitely, uh, we have the desire to extend this to Windows. And once we land on a shape that is uh, that everybody is happy with uh, for tabs, uh, that's our next step. Uh, yeah, Ivo, I think. Uh, no, sorry, Bernard. I believe is next. Yeah. So um, you know, previously we've talked about region capture, which kind of had the opposite goal, which is to restrict the region of capture to a certain part of the screen where po possibly because other portions maybe had stuff that you didn't want the uh, to be shown so i'm wondering is there some interaction with this like could could somebody potentially use this to get around those restrictions so if i if i'm doing region capture i shouldn't be able to do this too right to scroll around and get to the stuff that you didn't want me to see um so region capture was not really intended as a way for anybody outside of the application to limit the application. It was the application that was limiting itself. So basically the application still, if it wanted, had access to all of the pixels on the screen uh, that were available. And then it chose to just remove those by calling a method. Uh, right. So just like there is nothing compelling the application to call crop to, which is the method associated with region capture, uh, I, I don't think that there is any, like the application does not uh, benefit of ways to get around restrictions that itself applies because it can just avoid applying those restrictions. Yeah, but uh, I'm kind of wondering if I've, if I've called crop to, I don't really want to go outside the crop region. Uh, and I'm wondering if this would, does it, would it essentially stop with, with the scrolling stop at the, at the crop to boundaries? That um, we could consider that. I um, I don't. It just I seems think... weird to call crop two and then have it scroll outside of the crop two region. Uh, yes, but the application could also choose to just not do that. But if you think that this uh, that this is not ergonomic for the application, that it might miscalculate the coordinates, then yes, I, I'm definitely open to uh, to doing that. To saying that if you apply 
crop two, maybe your coordinates are automatically restricted. Uh, we can definitely discuss uh, the interaction of those two uh, APIs. Uh, does that make sense? Yeah. Awesome. So, Yanomar again. So, uh, I, I think that the for me, the security properties of exposing of the user agent exposing a scroll bar or allow scrolling of the preview or some kind of zoom. Uh, if you go back a couple of slides where you uh, had the little okay. zoom control, the, Tell me when where you show the little zoom control, yeah. Um, okay, so you mean little... in the middle of the video where it was already showing the indicator? Is that? Oh, yeah, you... yeah, that's the indicator, yes. Now, I understand your concern about uh, matching UX and leaving that to applications, but I think the security pr profile of this of the user agent adding that, similar to the way we add Chrome controls to picture in picture, uh, it's in much better because then that solves you don't have to ask extra permission, which getting rid of an extra permission would be great, and also not having to deal with remote viewers, giving them controls, all of that seems solved. So I would love to pursue uh, an approach where if we can solve the applications problems with positioning and that kind of stuff and, and giving the application control of whether to show this or not, I think that would be very interesting to us. Um, so definitely if we um, move this uh, to be the domain of the browser, uh, that would make things a little bit more secure, but I don't really know if we want to pay that cost because we uh, there is the it's counterbalanced by reduced flexibility for the application. And uh, it also means that, for example, we won't be able to, an application would not be able to delegate that to remote participants. Now, I think that is actually a desirable property of the API, uh, because if you're already delegating control to a reputable application uh, that you trust, um, then you trust that application to also delegate that capability on your behalf, sanely. So only allow remote users that you have allow listed, and only at the time that you allow listed. And I think that might actually make sense. Uh, yes, uh, Guido, do you want me to finish the point, or is that related to the point I'm making? We'll finish, finish, finish. Okay. So I think, uh, and that's just one example of um, that's just one example of the uh, what you can do with it, increased flexibility and. I think that we should not discard that flexibility unless we believe that we cannot provide security uh, with it, which I think we could. Uh, sorry. Yes, Guido? Uh, yes. I um, was going to say, could, let's say, if we, if this API were restricted, uh, would require like focus and the thing being visible, and otherwise all the methods would fail, but maybe that would, I think that could address some of the issues about the application scrolling without the user noticing? Um, yes and no, because one thing that the application could do is it could st uh, stop showing the user the uh, new frames. So basically it could freeze on an old frame and it could scroll while the user does not really realize that some things are being scrolled. Uh, we did implement a couple of restrictions, so the application has to be focused at least. And that means that it's not going to do it while the user is not even interacting with it. Uh, but that also comes at the cost because it means that I cannot delegate remote control to a user while I myself focus the shared tab. Um, so these are all things that I think we should uh, consider. Um, are there any other uh, mitigations you could think of except for focus that might serve to close the security gap? Yeah, that, that's kind of what I was thinking. Like... I guess uh, there's activation or even being able, uh, only allowing this API as part of uh, a trusted event click, event handler or something like that as well, that would further restrict where you could actually do that. So but I'm not sure it's enough. Yeah, so the current implementation in Chrome uh, is that we, uh, if you don't have permission yet, uh, user activation is required. The prompt is not going to be shown otherwise. But after that, we don't actually require user activation. And uh, the idea was to allow for future, uh, you know, um, delegation to remote users. 
So do I understand so, that there are remote? You just start then. <laughs> Sorry. So it would be good to understand better the remote viewer use case. Uh, the, remote use, the, the remote user use case is kind of simple. It's basically imagine that right now you wanted to take control of uh, the presentation, and I wanted to allow you control. Why should we not? And the answer is obviously because uh, other bad things could happen. But at least in this uh, limited scenario where I trust the video conferencing application, uh, that seems safe. Yeah, it seems even more frightening if we are starting to think that this API will be extended to remote con remote control, I guess. But not so, extended, like the, the shape already allows it. Well, you're already saying that some restriction that would be good to have for security or privacy reasons uh, would not benefit this use case, so let's not have them. Uh, we're talking about the focus requirement. Uh, yeah, I was meaning, hey, let's restrict uh, this API to only like be being strict about like click events and things like that. And you're saying, hey, it does not go well with remote control. Uh, yeah. So it seems that uh, we're already, uh, this proposal is already uh, having a model where remote control is desired and is, is a first step towards that goal. And, uh, but, no, uh, uh, I just don't want to, li uh, to uh, limit the flexibility to allow remote control in the future, but just so I understand, uh, when you said clicking, uh, what I understood was that basically every single invocation of any of the APIs to change the zoom or to scroll would require a new user activation. Uh, and I responded based on that, but maybe I misunderstood you? Yep, that, that, was, that was what, what I was meaning. And you said, hey, we don't do that because we want to have remote control. And I'm like, yeah, but maybe we do not want remote control and you're loosening the security principles uh, because you want remote control. But anyway, uh, that, that's that. Um, I, I guess it's uh, up for web developers to tell us whether remote control is a strong requirement for them or not. Um, definitely. Um, if this did not allow remote control, it would still be a significant API that would allow applications to do interesting things, and I would still be interested, but I just don't want to, uh, from the get-go, uh, uh, give up on remote control before we have the chance to have the discussion. And um, it's not uh, clear to me why we would want to block remote control. Because if you already allow the web application uh, to interact with the shared uh, tab, uh, sorry, uh, there was a chat message here. No? Okay. Uh, Yanivar, yes, you've raised your hand. That was the ping. Uh, yes, to clarify a little bit why. So the screen capture spec already says that some adjacent goals that are not in scope of the specification, online document sharing, you know, it's remote assistance temporarily taking over control of the system or co-browsing. It's not that these aren't useful things, but that uh, I think YouTube is full of uh, uh, examinations of where, uh, especially elderly uh, people, are being take, taken advantage of by people calling them up and uh, guiding people through a process of uh, going into their bank accounts and helping mm -hmm. them withdraw funds to. So, so th th these are extremely, so any kind of remote control or the appearance of remote control, the security uh, concerns are um, much graver, I think, than the use case we originally were solving here. So it'd be uh, nice to isolate it uh, so that we avoid tackling too much, maybe. Uh, definitely, you've made uh, two claims here. Number one is that the uh, media capture uh, spec currently says uh, that it is not uh, searching, uh, seeking uh, to enable remote control. And all that means is that if we wanted to enable remote control, we would have to use a different spec. Having a separate spec is not a problem here. Your other claim was that uh, users were being tricked. Uh, and definitely that happens, but it's not clear to me that this API would increase uh, uh, scammers' ability to trick users. Uh, of course, I could be wrong, but it seems to me like if you're already in a call with somebody and they're already sharing your screen, the screen with you, uh, you kind of need to trick them uh, verbally anyway uh, and scrolling and zooming, like just revealing a few more 
uh, pixels does not seem to tip the scales here, but that's just my opinion. Well, I would disagree because most of these, if you watch these videos, you'll see that most people get scammed into downloading TeamViewer or VNC client. Uh, but so there would be a relaxation of protections if they could just do it natively in their browser with clicking some permission prompts. Well, with so, the so it would move the bar. Well, with the exception that the key uh, capability of actually clicking on things would not be there. <laughs> and to Correct. be expressly out of scope for this API forever. Like I, it is my opinion that we should never introduce clicking through this API. Yes, and I agree with that. And uh, that's also, uh, but so, but even remote viewing uh, use cases have some concerns, I think here, where you could potentially look, you can pull a user into, it's not clear to, most participants here, I think, initially, that uh, a viewer would be able to look at something other than what they were sharing. Okay. Uh, Bernard, uh, uh, you're next. Yeah, so uh, I, I just noted that uh, Florence said uh, no keyboard events either, and uh, I agree with that. Uh, you add the keyboard events and clicking, and you're, uh, as as Jana Ivar said, you're, uh, you're, a, you're a gift to uh, spammers which nowadays include nation states, by the way, they're whole nation states that are making a living based on this thing, this kind of stuff. So uh, yeah, I, I think keeping this, having some very well-defined limits is pretty important. You know, we used to think that having to install an extension was a big enough deal to protect people, but as Yanni Var said, that's pretty clearly not true anymore, so. Understood, understood. Uh, so, uh, sorry if I was not clear about that before when I said no click, I also meant no keyboard events. Uh, and um, for all of that, I have a separate uh, proposal called Video Portal where it would be doing things completely differently, uh, but we're not pursuing that at the moment. So, yes, uh, this is only for scrolling and zooming and nothing else. Um, so, just uh, I'm almost out of time, so I just want to say it seems like we're all uh, on board. And I wonder if uh, we could have a, a discussion about uh, remote control, like basically uh, allowing a remote user to do that. After we conclude that discussion, I would like us to maybe have a discussion about whether it's the application or the browser that needs to offer that. Uh, and then if we conclude that discussion, maybe we could move on to the details. Is that something that everybody uh, think uh, sounds reasonable or am I off? I, th I think uh, I agree that the uh, non-remote use case is useful, but I don't think we agree that this API shape of giving necessarily or that giving necessarily application control to do the scrolling is a good idea. But at least that's my view. Yes, and uh, I wonder like what the next steps are on making sure that we have this discussion and make that uh, decision collectively of whether we really want to out outscope uh, remote control because. I need uh, to have a chance to change your mind. Do, do we have a GitHub place where we could discuss this in within the WebRTC working group? Is it uh, share? It, it, the, the repo right people? now only has the explainer. I will be uploading the uh, spec soon, but you can already file issues, uh, and I'll email you the uh, the link. Yeah. And uh, is, it, think... is it WebRTC working group repo or? Uh, no, it's in the screen capture community group right yeah. now. So, so maybe we could discuss okay. that later. But that, that, that's something we could. It, it, okay. it would be I, I good to have a place, a Weber C working group place. For now, I'd be happy to discuss it in screen capture, even if that doesn't end up being the final oh, place. So, yeah, so I suggest. Okay, so uh, yeah, UN, are you also done with that? We basically keep the discussion on the screen capture community group uh, repo, and then we move it to the Weber C working group when you feel like uh, it's ready to be adopted. Uh, for the record, UN has raised his, uh, his, his thumb and then a reaction pop up. Yeah, sounds okay. good. Uh, Thank you very much. We, we're going to turn it over to Florent. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, so today I would like to uh, discuss two issues that we have uh, with the WebRTC and Code Transform uh, specification. Uh, they are related to um, added a few more fields and uh, expanding the scope of uh, one of the different interface. So first issue uh, 225, um, on the next slide, please. 
this is about adding a capture timestamp and the center capture time offset to uh, the encoded frame metadata. This is uh, when we have uh, frames that we receive, that we can transform uh, through the API. We receive a frame with some metadata that has an RTP timestamp, which is very useful. Uh, but it doesn't have any other information. We solve that in the WebRTC extensions, uh, which is a separate specification, um, by adding information that is contained within the RTP header extension called um, apps, um, apps uh, capture time, which um, has information about the capture timestamp, when was the frame captured, and um, a clock offset that uh, helps you understand uh, uh, this uh, value. So uh, we added that to uh, the RTC RTP contributing source, which is great. And uh, this is in extensions. We would like to have this as well, uh, this information as well, exposed in the RTC encoded audio and video frame metadata. Uh, so um, we have uh, two fields that would be added, both could be um, uh, DOM high res timestamp types, uh, which is a standard type for um, a timestamp and the same type as uh, is defined in um, WebRTC extensions. And uh, we have two different sides. One is on the sender side, one is on the receiving side. On the server side, we could uh, expose those values um, that are captured locally. And uh, there shouldn't be any problem doing that for uh, most implementations, I believe. On the receiving side, uh, it would only be if the uh, RTP header extension has been negotiated and uh, is attached to the receiving frames, and we would see them. There is a possibility to have uh, interpolation of the values for all the intermediate um, uh, frames uh, that, are, that are received, just like is specified in the web apps extensions specification. The goal of uh, those two new fields, well, new is relatively, um, it is not quite accurate, but the, the goal of this field is to cap, um, establish some statistics uh, on uh, when this has been uh, received and captured and uh, to uh, calculate a delay. This has been requested um, internally at Google and by some uh, third parties. Uh, the issue, original issue was has been created by uh, Sergio, uh, who is here, here with us today. Uh, in the meeting, so I believe this had some value. And I do have a tentative uh, pull request, but I believe it needs a few more changes. Do we have uh, any questions or comments about this? So we have uh, two people in the queue. Bernard is first. Yeah, so I think this is a good thing. Uh, certainly, I think it does make sense uh, to do it as you proposed. I did have one question, though. Uh, which is, uh, I think you asked for capture timestamp in web codex as well. Um, and uh, the I reason, yeah. It. Someone else might have. Uh, I think Harold maybe have asked uh, for it. Um, and the reason is that, um, you know, the, the stuff that has to be sent over the wire, that's uniquely WebRTC, but the captures timestamp also seems to me like something that should be, uh, well, it, it would be nice to be able to construct you know, the RTC encoded frame from a web codex uh, encoded chunk. And, um, you know, if the capture timestamp isn't in the, uh, isn't in available somewhere, you kind of have to suck it out through through other means that might be awkward. Anyway, that that's my only comment is it'd be useful to uh, be able to construct one from the other. If, if I may, Bernard, I, I yeah. have the same, I have the same, uh feedback and the, the, the cases where you use media stream track transform to uh, transform a video frame uh, like you do background blur 
and exactly and still, exactly. And still you have a video frame you, you want to have to send the capture timestamp and then you have right. a track and you still want to to populate uh, everything that is available there and so on so right, right. the notion the definition of locally captured frames in the pr we will need to be uh, precise about what we mean and maybe we will need some uh, extension in web codex field as well yeah i mean you you actually filed an issue in web codex which is one of <laughs> in addition to the other video frame uh uh stuff we never got to that's another one we never got to <laughs> Right. Yeah. Uh, I believe that uh, those are separate issue, and I agree that at some point uh, we will need to be able to construct uh, artist encoded frames from um, a video or audio chunk. Uh, but I, I believe that's a separate issue uh, that can be discussed yeah, uh, at another point. Uh, and there's uh, definitely many parties interested in doing that. So, um, especially for uh, the um, RTP transport uh, use case, I believe. Um, so yeah, this is this is a possibility uh, for later discussion. Um, I would like to feedback on this uh, thing specifically, and if there are issues, we can make sure that those are addressed in the specification. Uh, I would like just to establish what uh, those are specifically here. Um, if there's any opposition to adding those fields uh, right now in the, uh, the frame metadata, um, I would like to have more information about this so we can refine the proposal. So I guess the next uh, uh, next step would be to just review the PR. Is that what? If what we're uh, this is something that uh, is desirable. Yes, uh, we can uh, have editors iterate on the uh, pull request. Absolutely. Okay, so so let me ask it this way: Is there anyone who has an objection to this? Okay, no. So I guess the next step is just to review the PR. Yeah, I guess uh, we'll do that at the editors meeting and uh, iterate on this so that we can integrate it uh, in the encoded uh, transform specification thank you i guess we can move on to uh, the next issue 226 thank you for changing the slide so um we would like to make some changes to uh, how rtc encoded audio frame is exposed um our goal is to uh, do audio decoding in an audio worklet. Um, we would like to um, have a script transform running in a worklet or some other way to get the data efficiently to an audio worklet to do decoding there and uh, then using all the um, web audio APIs uh, in order to do all the fancy work that all the uh, most applications are doing now today with regards to echo consolidation and uh, other stats. So um, in order to get the audio uh, frame data into an audio worklet to decode it, there is currently two ways. One, uh, which is to run the transformer uh, on uh, a worker and then transfer the data, which is uh, just a uh, regular uh, byte array into, um, uh, which is an, a byte buffer into uh, the audio worklet. That doesn't require any API change, but this leads to a lot of uh, JavaScript invocations. And those would happen in the worker context, which is not uh, real time, uh, unlike the audio worklet. Uh, this is uh, bad for both performance because you just need to have a lot of um, bridging calls and uh, not great for reliability of um, for decoding all the audio and doing all the analysis that you need to do. There's a second approach, which would be to run a transformer directly on the audio worklet. This is not currently possible. And this is what I would like to discuss. This approach has a, a, a nice property that it requires less thread hopping because everything would run 
on it would be delivered on the audio workloads. Uh, we have uh, two uh, people on the queue. Um, do you, uh, you and uh, do you, I have uh, have you seen the next slide and do, can we present it or do we want to start discussion now? Uh, let me check what the other slide is then. Uh, I can it was the next slide. okay. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead, and then I I'll, yeah. I'll, Okay. So, uh, in order to get an RTC script transformer uh, to run in a audio workload, there's a few uh, things that would need to happen in terms of um, web IDL. Um, we would need to expose a, a few interfaces into the new audio workload uh, context, which would be the script transformer, the encoded video frame, and the transform event. As mentioned, this is only for audio frame. So uh, no video decoding, so no need to expose the video frame. There's a need to uh, extend the constructor of the RTC RTP script transform to accept the um, first parameter uh, to be an audio worklet. Right now, it only accepts a worker. And uh, an audio worklet is a worklet, but not a worker. So yeah, I would like to add some checks to verify that uh, the sender is of type audio to make sure that we reject uh, attempts to do that for video content. And add uh, the on RTC transform uh, event handler into the audio workload global scope, uh, which allows you to receive um, the transformer on the audio workload. There's a possibility to add a few extra changes because um, a transformer uh, API allows uh, things like requesting a video keyframe and things like that, which don't really apply for audio. Uh, so we could uh, harden uh, also uh, those functions to make sure that if those are called on uh, audio, they throw an error or they are silently ignored or something like that, which is something that we could do independently on top of this. That's, uh, that was my presentation uh, questions. Uh, you and you was, on the queue previously, do you still want to talk? Yeah, sure. So, so the, the thing is, with an audio worklet, you you might want to share the buffer, uh, and I think what you said in the past was it, it's difficult to to use it. Uh, so one one like uh, a variant of shared buffer is a readable stream, a beyond readable stream, that you would transfer to the worklet. And then you can uh, do the decoding or the encoding because this proposal there allows to do both encoding and decoding. And decoding, maybe it's fine. Encoding, probably it's not. Well, maybe. I, I don't know. But uh, it, it feels, uh, especially if it was them, it's probably probably problematic. So with a, a BIOB, uh readable stream that you transfer, basically you push array buffers uh in the worker from the worker and from the worklet you will read bytes with the same array buffer so there's a limited gc and it it, it would serve somehow uh, as a data buffer and similarly to a shared buffer except that you don't have the same timing precision so you we uh, i would think we can mitigate the security issues there so may maybe uh that, that's a solution and then it would be up to use agent to to make the transfer of uh, readable uh, the upstream uh, efficient enough. So no no change needed and we, we will all, all be good there. All right. Just so a couple of user agent uh, optimizations. All right, so that will be approach number one that I presented in the previous slide, uh, which I believe uh, might be a little bit problematic because we would have uh, one uh, JavaScript callback uh, to, that runs on a worker, their frame. Audio frames are very, usually very small, uh, but they are very frequent. So that might be um, that might be a problem for performance, which is why uh, we believe it, it's better to just run everything directly onto the worklet. My, my understanding was that the, the concern was that uh, mostly uh, doing 
um, the work in the worker and then transferring for post message every array buffer and then you have GC on the worklet and, and so so on. That that was not efficient. And uh, the solution to that uh, with readable stream job, you you fix at least that. And maybe uh, with this optimization, uh, this is good enough and fast enough so that we we don't have to expose new APIs. Uh, I, I'm not sure whether you tried it, but that's that's worth trying and that's worth uh, getting numbers to validate whether that's sufficient or not. Okay. Uh, so, uh, yeah, well, you want us to get more data on, to know whether this is the right thing or not to do. Especially uh, oh. with readable stream beyond, yeah. Right. Uh, also, one thing to add, um, it's been discussed on the issue that it's not possible to just transfer uh, the stream from the worker to the audio worklet. There are some internal streams uh, issue related to that. So we would have to transfer the data, uh, to push the data direct, uh, directly. Correct. You decode in the worker, and then you push the raw data in the, as a, you enqueue the raw data within a readable job stream source, and you transfer the readable job stream and you consume the data on the worklet. Yeah, that, that would be uh, the approach. Okay. And hopefully it's good enough. Okay, uh, Paul. Hello. So with my uh, hat of audio working group person on, uh, I will say that the second uh, proposal cannot be implemented because it requires garbage collection. And so that's, uh, that's a no. Uh, the first uh, proposal is likely to work uh, significantly with higher performance according to the extensive performance measurements that has happened in the professional audio industry, uh, some including WebRTC. Um, I understand that shadow buffer is not for everybody. Uh, however, this is an advanced use case, so maybe it is. But as you went said, um, there are solutions. So we can do BYOB. Uh, that will do copies, but we can do that uh, more efficiently, more likely. The, we could also uh, go the other way and increase composability and usability of the API and unlock new use cases by doing some sort of script transform worklet, where uh, it's exactly like the audio worklet, except you are very close to the network stack. You get your new packets every now and then. And when you get your new packets, you're very, very close. You've write into a shadow buffer or whatever me communication mechanism that doesn't GC. And then that gets communicated without context, well, with, with exactly one context switch and no GC and no problem to your audio worklet. And I think we get uh, all the correct set of characteristics and the highest performance that you can do on a computer with that design uh, without the problems of having to do everything manually via a shared buffer, which is also the solution. Okay. Um, yeah, I think this is um, something we, we, we can definitely try. Um, the BYOB approach uh, could be uh, okay. definitely something. So, uh, to interrupt, can anybody send over a link to the BYOB approach so we can circulate in the audio working group and figure out the real-time safety so then we can recommend or not recommend its usage uh, whenever someone wants to integrate with the audio worklet. Well, it's in the sprint spec. Yes, okay. uh, I'm, I'm not sure anybody has written uh, right. or has transferred this, but so it's, it's probably new. Yeah, it's, uh, but, but, but the good thing is there is you enough. can the, the good thing there is that you, you can read inside a buffer that the audio worklet would, so the audio worklet would create just one buffer and would say, please write the data in that buffer. So yes, that, yes. There, this, this way, no GC and so on. So it's, yeah, uh, yeah, but we need, we need, we need some sort of queue, obviously. So, um, so yeah, uh, all good, all good. That has, that seems to have the correct properties, but, um, yeah, we, we, we look better within the audio working group. Should, should we should we find an issue there, then on a new end, trying in the uh, audio working group somehow? Yeah, I mean, the the, the scenario that, that we want to do here is perfectly valid from our point of view. So 
if we found that uh, we need something from the audio working group side, yeah, most definitely an issue need to be filed, yeah. Okay, uh, uh, we're a bit over time, so I think we need to wrap this up quickly. Is there any remaining just, I just questions? just have a question to Paul. Uh, do you think that decoding on the audio worklet thread is uh, possible? It is possible, granted the codec implementation itself is real-time safe, but uh, yeah, that's been done okay. yeah, frequently. All right, thank you for the clarification. Okay, uh, we'll uh, explore that approach and uh, I can reach out to you and you and to make sure that we have the right issues at the right place to continue the discussion. Thank you. All right, so I'm up next and uh, we're discussing media capture uh, main, just two issues. I'll probably go through the first one real quick. Next slide. Uh, I don't have, because I'm actually not sure this is really a working group. Uh, item or if just a chair item, but we did get a request uh, wondering uh, why, you know, why can't we just be media capture instead of media capture main uh, for the main spec? And um, so I just want to get the working group uh, feeling on this one. Uh, today we have some differences in naming in the W3 realm versus on GitHub. So today we have media capture streams in W3C, we have an on WPT. But then on GitHub, we're media capture dot main uh, dash main for historical reasons. So we can change them all to media capture, or we could just leave. We could just change the W three domains and leave the GitHub to be media capture main. And I also guess I had a question: if anyone knows why we still have why it's still called WebRTC PC on GitHub, but it's called WebRTC on TR. Uh, but I, mostly, any objections to simplifying the name? I'm not hearing any objections, so um, we'll just, we could, uh, and yeah. just some uh, history. So the the thought when we split uh, the spec from it, between WebRTC and Media Capture Streams was actually that Media Capture Streams would be a main spec, and uh, and that uh, that's that's where the Media Capture main comes from. Uh, and uh, WebRTC PC would just be one of the many of the multiple WebRTC uh, specs that would uh, relate different ways of doing things. Now it turned out that yes, media capture streams was a main spec, but uh, we never changed the name. And uh, WebRTC PC never got a serious competitor yet, but they're still popping up out out of the woodwork, so so uh, this might have been uh, not up, uh, shown by history to not be completely rational. Anyway, I think that uh, collapsing it, the main spec for media capture down to media capture wouldn't be a bad thing. I mean, it's uh, it, it's a bit of a mess to, because there are now millions of links all over the world to this uh, thing, but. Uh, No, no great deal in from my side. Yes, the, hopefully there's some way to do a uh, link forwarding that won't break old links. Yeah, uh, Elad? Um, yeah, I want to say exactly that. I think that I've got some experience with uh, link forwarding and basically I think GitHub allows you to do something that basically uh, like all files in a given repo, <coughs> you know, it takes basically the, uh, the URL and replaces just part of it. Uh, I could try to look it up for you. Right. No, I, I think that's good. Yeah, we could do that after. Yeah. 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 So I'd like to spend. Yes. So I'm still hoping to get to my next issue. So, oh, Ansi? Yeah. Speaking from experience, make sure you also redirect encores in your document. So you need to do that with yeah. scripts for the editor's draft. So sadly, we, mm -hmm. have, we are doing that. So just remember. OK. So maybe for now, we'll just change the TR version in which uh, might be easier to do at publication. I'm not sure. Yeah. All right, but in any case, it sounds like most people agree media capture by itself would be better than media capture screens. Uh, all right. Okay, I'm not hearing any objections overall. So uh, 
Thank you. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> We're a little over time here, so uh, I'm still seeing there. You, yeah. So um, basically, this is uh, issue nine six six, which is a long thread. I don't recommend reading all of it. Um, but there's some uh, confusion with the device change event and when it should fire. This was last discussed uh, in October meeting, and the spec actually normatively say that uh, when new media input or output are made available to the user agent <clears throat> or previously available becomes unavailable or system default changes, then it should run the device change notification steps. Uh, now, this limits when the device change notification steps run to when OS changes happen, which then limits both when device change device device change event fires, as well as when the media devices store device list changes, which is the internal slot that enumerate devices works off of. <clears throat> now, enumerate devices will do additional filtering based on uh, device permission exposure, device information exposure, whether you call get user media or not. So this means that this is not the same as calling it every time enumerate devices, the function would produce different results. <clears throat> so Safari so actually violates this right now because it's firing it from the set the device information exposure and get user media. Uh, if and only if the, uh, from my testing anyway, if and only if the application has previously called enumerate devices and the user has uh, more than one device per kind. Uh, Yuan, did you mean to speak to the specific point? Yeah, I, I don't think Safari violates this. Uh, we we can we can see that uh, Safari is including synthetic device, and it's removing it and getting the actual devices and exposing them. So I think the spec allows uh, the way Safari is currently implemented. I, I'm sorry, Safari is adding what what device? So Safari is basically uh, exposing synth synthetic devices, like fake devices. And, oh. and and that's it. And when the user actually allows, uh, then uh, things are different, and the actual devices are exposed. And I think it's you can say you can see uh, the devices are made available, and that's what we are doing. And usually we, we try not to differentiate to make between user agent and OS, like it's just one <laughs> surface. And that's uh, that's why I think Safari is not violating uh, the spec there. But uh, in this case, the stored device list internal slot does not change, right? It's just the filtering uh, by running the uh, conversion to the uh, uh, enumerated devices output that produces a I, different result. In that case. It, it changes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> we, are, we, are, okay. we, are not, we are not providing, so the, the device gathering is done in another process, and we are not sending the uh, actual uh, device names and so on, and device IDs and whatever. Uh, to enumerate devices, so this is not the same, the same uh, stored device list. Value. Okay, all right. Uh, thank you for that clarification. I'll amend my language to be a bit softer here then, uh, but I think it doesn't change my overall argument, which would be that dev web developers will have some difficulty interpreting um, what I'm going to cover on the next slide. Uh, also, there's a, there was a question on the issue whether OS device label changes are covered under new media input. And this issue was filed <coughs> by someone who, excuse me, <coughs> basically uh, one of this and others have also mentioned that they have a use case of updating in content UX. Um, <coughs> and they would like to be notified of any delta, any difference in the numerate devices whatsoever. Uh, and the other use case is to have a strong signal from a user inserting a device, which is next slide. So a claim here is that a user inserting a media device at the start of a call is a strong signal <clears throat> that some applications may want to, like if I put on my air, earbuds right before the meeting, that might be a stronger signal that I want to use them than if I didn't. <clears throat> now, earbuds, are, you know, like AirPods are, uh, you can often, if the application can detect that, you know, these are actually AirPods, then chances are, you know, if you see them, you use them because they're they're only active when they're in the person's ear. So if you see them, you don't really need to detect insertion. But that's not true for all kinds of microphones or even speakers. So that means that reliably detecting the signal is hard. A device change event 
uh, that appears <clears throat> right when you give user media access. If, if that contains a secondary microphone or camera in the list, it no longer means that it, it's not, no longer necessarily true that it was just inserted by the user. And so this leads to, we have competing use cases, maybe we need two events. So uh, for argument's sake here, I'm mentioning two potential names, device info change that would fire for every delta exposure or label change, and a new device inserted event that would fire after get user media. Maybe even if you, I inserted, uh, and, and it, the benefit of this event, it would only fire when you physically inserted or the OS enabled a device based on a user response. And uh, basically, that seems like a way to solve both these cases. So, uh, Guido? Uh, yes. Uh, do we really need the two events if we are now including the list of devices in the event? Sorry, can you explain again? Uh, so we're, we're now, uh, we agreed to, to change the event, uh, the, the, the original device change event to include the list, the updated list of devices in the event. Mm -hmm. So uh, isn't that enough to know if the, if it was an insertion uh, or not, so so that you wouldn't need the, well, the inserted? So the issue, or, I think, is enumerate devices uh, <clears throat> in the spec. Uh, will have very limited information ahead of get user media for privacy reasons. So as soon as get user media is called and accepted, uh, devices, if you call enumerate devices after get user media, you'll see a lot more devices than you saw, potentially than you saw before. So how does a web application know whether, why those devices appeared? And the, the existing advice is that you're supposed to read the list, compare the list from before and after, and any new device means, oh, this was added now. But you can't tell whether that was added because of additional permission, that additional access, exposure access that was given granted to the page, or whether a physical uh, change happened that was uh, user initiated. And that's the signal that's missing. And would you fire both events or? <clears throat> uh... Yeah. Okay. I mean, the, the nice thing with events is that they're cheap, right? If there's no event handler, then nothing happens. Okay. Like these events don't bubble or anything like that. So, uh, and also I mentioned if if three events is too many, you know, we can, of course, reduce it down to two events quite easily. Um, uh, Yuen? Uh, yes, I have the same uh, feedback as Guido. I think that... Uh, we have now uh, the device change event uh, could could be extended. It's already uh, it's no longer a simple event. So having like a flag saying, hey, I'm firing this event because a device was inserted. Uh, that seems reasonable. It's simple, it's a Boolean, and it, it fits the bill. And we, we might not even need to say remove device, like blah, 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 or whatever. Uh, we might just want to say, okay, you check whether a new device like it's a boolean, you check it and then you do something. If it's not there, maybe you just ignore ignore it and keep it just to uh, update the, the UX to to show the picker. But that's all, and that's that's a minimal change. It's easier than adding new events, I think. Well, yeah. easier for for uh, implement, implementers and spec writers, but I don't know that a boolean would necessarily tell you which device was inserted. So the difference would be that we dedicate a, a unique event to it you could get a, a specific information that this device was inserted. Yeah, I mean, we, we could we could add, mm. if we if a Boolean is not enough, we can extend uh, with more information. Uh, I'm not sure whether we actually need more than the Boolean. Uh, maybe, maybe not. Because, yeah, mm. I, I, I'm not quite sure there. Well, if, if uh, the last get in the mirror devices, I get limited information, and now I see three microphones, and the Boolean is true. I don't know which microphone was inserted. Sure. So maybe there's a new devices array in this event. That's, that's fine as well. Uh, right. But maybe right. the bull event is yeah. good enough. I, I don't know. That's something. But I, I would keep, I would mm. tend to keep just one event and to extend it uh, mm. since mm. it's no longer a simple event anyway. OK. Uh, Guido? Uh, yeah, my feedback is, is very similar. So let's keep the same event so that applications, it's backwards compatible. 
and then the event mm -hmm. will just have more detailed information about what happened. And yeah, we can iterate a bit if whether a boolean is enough or not. I'm inclined to believe that a boolean mm -hmm. should be enough, but yeah, we can give it a a bit of thinking and decide if if <laughs> if, if we need uh, more than a boolean in addition to the right. list of classes we're already adding. But uh, keeping the same event so that applications can uh, yeah, don't need to start adding new handlers or having two APIs mm -hmm. or anything more than right. the event looks pretty compatible with, with uh, what we already have. Right. Yeah, I think progress in one form or the other would, would help us um, maybe also then change. So I think we're also talking about changing the device change event then to fire for any difference, any noticeable difference that enumerate devices might uh, Produce uh, even if uh, we extended it to not just fire from OS changes, but any other changes. Yes, that would and be fine as well. Um, any objection to that direction? All right. Okay. I think yeah, we're behind time, so that's good. Thank you. All right. Thanks, thanks, Bernard, Harald, and Jan Ivar for inviting us today here. So uh, my name is Ansi Koste, and I'm here today with Mikiel Bakker. So uh, I'll first give you a uh, high-level view into the local peer-to-peer -peer API, and then Mikiel will share our proposal and outline a few areas where we think web participants working group participants' feedback would be especially wanted. Also, we acknowledge we have. Web transport working group uh, experts here in this call, so feedback from that front also much appreciated. So, so yeah. And I, before I go on, I want to thank Bernard for your feedback and insights you already provided in this slide deck. So there's a ton of additional material added after our slides. So uh, let's look at this slide here. We put a backgrounder. So first of all, this is a new web incubator community group incubate, incubation. Uh, there's prototyping activity going on in Chromium and as a, a Go library. So Mikiel's been working on the Go library part. Uh, this started approximately a year ago in YCG. So we, we put out an explainer and we were quite happy to see that this explainer actually became the second most commented uh, proposal ever in YCG. I think it was Elage, actually, one of the Elage incubations that had the top spot and we were the second in number. So maybe we kind of witnessed that there is some sort of demand for this type of feature. So uh, what, what we are basically trying to uh, accomplish here, so we are trying to create an offline first version of P2P Quick for the LAN use case in principle. So that, that's kind of the broader picture. So the local peer-to-peer -peer API enables browsers to connect securely over what we call a local communication medium. And of course, importantly, without the aid of a server in the middle. So uh, let me expand a bit on this kind of, let's say, key design drivers here. So, so basically, uh, this API aims to provide a powerful uh, building block, a new building block for developers. And at the same time, you know, ensure that there is a seamless, secure and privacy preserving experience for the user. So this is a lot of fancy words, but we kind of take this to the heart. So, so we first of all, we put the user agent in control, both during the discovery and authentication. And we work hard to expose only bare minimum communication medium topology information to an origin. Um, if we look at the motivation, we put, put this illustration here on the slide on the right hand side. So basically the motivation here is the local network is not a first class citizen of the web. So it, it, what that means, you know, it's easier for a browser to trust a uh, server somewhere far away than your network at that storage or your TV that's sitting right next to you. So that's, that's kind of the driving motivation. And some words about the goals. We, um, so first of all, we want to build a generic local peer-to-peer -peer API you know, and uh, provide an arbitrary by die communication channel to the web for devices in the context of this local communication medium. And as you can imagine, this includes usual uh, features such as, you know, 
methods to discover, request, connect to peers on this local communication medium, means to send and receive data after you have to have this connection to a peer device, uh, after this connection has been established. And of course, a good trait would be to enable secure HTTPS connections on the local communication medium as well. In this context, I'd like to actually appreciate and note uh, Martin Thompson's um, proposal called HTTPS for local domain. So Martin has been kind of also exploring uh, HTTP for local space, and we plan to, to loop in with him to get his insights. So uh, I think one more thing to say about the goal. So we want to commit to an open standards based implementation pod and stack. So this specification describes how the API can be implemented on top of the open screen protocol or OSP. Uh, that's also the basis for uh, second screen working groups API. So there's a presentation API, a remote playback API that built on top of this uh, open screen protocol as well. And it, it kind of defines the extension me mechanism. So we are making use of that rather than reinventing. So uh, while, while not described here, you know, this API is, is expected to be implementable on top of other transports when technically feasible. There's a kind of lot of community feedback coming in. Mikiel may talk about this a bit, or we can you know follow up later. So next slide, please. So about use cases, uh, let's start with the uh, offline collaboration. So, you know, collaboration tools that work during an internet outage or emer uh, outage or emergency situations. We heard from uh, from uh, developers and users, this is important. Or ephemeral group support, you know, you want to share files to a group with a single push versus sending it to each friend one at a time. Uh, if we look at the cross device workflow, Another example, so, you know, you want to send and receive files instantly, for example, photos, videos, between mobile phone, your tablet, your personal computer, without using mobile data or internet connection. Or maybe you want to add import file nearby or export the nearby buttons to your web version of Figma or the next, next Figma, uh, you know. That, that's one opportunity. Or maybe you know you have a video editing web app that allows users to un, uh, ingest footage directly from their phone. So that, that's also a reasonable use case. Um, maybe I will talk a bit about the local multiplayer. So you know in this key use case, we hear that there's an opportunity to run a game game in web app, for example, on a smart TV and use your mobile phone as the controller via this local peer-to-peer -peer API to send control messages. Or you could run a two-player webcam on two mobile phones and sync messages between two players instantly. Um, yeah, for local in-app in sharing, similarly quickly share photos, videos with friends without relying on cloud services. So, so yeah, those are some of the key, key use cases. Others important are like we receive feedback from people who work on in disaster relief that it's, it's important to them to be able to use web-based tools to work on ad hoc networks in the absence of internet infrastructure in such situations. Or, of course, in home services and IoT space, you may want to seamlessly connect to your network at that storage or your home security system and avoid kind of workarounds that include uh, cell site certification or, or cloud proxy services. Or maybe you want to allow your web app to connect to your robot mover vacuum or some such so those were kind of to get the flavor uh what the use cases are uh, i'd like to now hand over to mikiel to mikiel to present and talk about the proposal a bit of comparison how how this complements web rtc and some other apis and and then discuss with you the feedback wanted items and, and once again thanks bernard for your feedback that already arrived so it's it's much appreciated thank you All right, yeah, so my name is Michiel de Becker. Um, I worked a little bit on kickstarting the Python uh, WebRTC implementation, which is the Go port uh, that we did at some point. Um, anyway, so for the local peer-to-peer -peer API, what we're trying to do is um, actually we're trying to <laughs> reinvent the wheel as least as possible. We're actually trying to uh, put together some existing components in a novel way uh, without introducing too much new stuff. 
Um, and in this case, it's um, the discovery and authentication mechanism coming from the second screen group uh, from the open screen protocol. And then together with more generic peer-to-peer -peer, um, data transfer APIs coming from the WebRTC uh, and web transport backgrounds. Um, if you put that all together, you, you get an experience that's, uh, I think, similar to something like Chromecast or uh, maybe Matter IoT uh, kind of things where you're able to connect to uh, devices locally on your network, um, but then have a um, you know fully bidirectional just data communication channel, and you can do with it what you want. You know the idea is that we're not necessarily uh, deciding what people want to do with it. It's innovation at the edge. It's up to developers what exactly they want to do with this. Um, but we want to provide this as a new uh, new building block. Um, I think. Um, importantly, you know, um, we are kind of uh, taking a different approach, I think, towards the service discovery compared to ICE in the WebRTC stack, uh, where, uh, you know, we are trying to uh, facilitate the offline uh, first scenario, where uh, ICE would still require you to have an, an intermediary to uh, pass along um, for signaling. Um, and here, what we're trying to do is we use um, MDNS for service discovery. So it allows you to find peers uh, on the local network. Uh, and then we use uh, the um, SPAKE2 or the, the, um, the basically, you know, uh, the enter the pin code uh, to be able to authenticate um, that you are connecting to the right uh, peer um, to authenticate uh, the session. Uh, and then from there, we are layering on top um, the you know, necessary um, data communication. Um, we, we modeled here two APIs, one based on the RTC data channel um, previous work and one on web transport. Um, there's still an argument whether or not we need both. Um, I think yeah, data channel is very familiar and very simple for web developers to use, uh, whereas web transport is obviously more powerful. Um, so um, that's one of the points of feedback, I think, where we are still looking uh, uh, for some input from you guys, what you think on, um, on that um yeah so basically you know in a short um recap we try to find peers on the network we try to uh, authenticate uh, establish uh, mutual tls certificates using the spake 2 protocol and then we use that for uh, data communication um, if we go to the next slide uh, you know the things that uh, yeah this is a comparison i did with uh, webrtc um you know just to make it more familiar um i think um yeah as i mentioned before it's all quite similar um the only thing that we're doing differently is the discovery um again to make sure that, that there's no uh, other intermediaries required it's something that a user can do by themselves um just by val validating the pin um, and then on the top of the um, transport the apis for like data channel and web transport they're quite similar uh, and that's actually one of the things we'd like to explore like maybe there is an opportunity to create some sort of a meta specification to ensure that these uh, uh, are actually the same APIs and that, that uh, developers can expect them to behave the same across uh, all possible uh, transports, um, with maybe the exception of some um, transport specific statistics. Um, yeah, I think on the next slide, we have a summary of the points that uh, I think are interesting to have your feedback on. So. Uh, one is on the differences or, or the interplay between data channel and the web transport API, whether um, both of them still are uh, warranted um, or uh, whether you feel the web transport, for example, has uh, completely surpassed data channel and, and um, it's no longer worth trying to support data channel. Um, and then the opportunity, as I mentioned, to standardize these APIs across all different transports. I think that would be really nice for developers to be able to expect uh, to be able basically use them interchangeably. Um, and then finally, comments on uh, Quick itself. I know that Bernard already provided a lot of feedback um, in the slides um, on that. Um, I think for us, it's also just interesting to know whether or not there's still interest in pursuing, uh, for example, peer-to-peer -peer Quick. Um, and yeah, maybe you know there might be synergies um, in that work with what we're trying to pursue here with the local peer-to-peer -peer API. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. Um, yeah, I would like to hear your feedback and, uh, of course, questions if there are any.
yeah, who uh, wants to manage the chairs, want to manage the queue, or how do you want to play this? Yeah, so let, let's see if we can go to about 9.35 or so. So we have like four, three or four minutes. You can manage it. OK, let's take uh, you on in order top down. Yeah, sure. Uh, my in initial reaction is that uh, local discovery is uh, nowadays uh, put under a prompt in some OSs. So I was wondering what was your uh, story about discovery and permission there? Because that, that could be a privacy sensitive uh, area. Yeah, yeah, all of these yeah. are, we do prompt for uh, all of these pieces. Um, and uh, I think it's a two stage approach. First, there is the actual connection, which we do, I think, on um, user agent level. I believe that that's how we specify it right now. And then you have the exposure of that uh, connection to a specific origin. Um, and that's another. Um, permission you need to accept. OK, so it can be origin A to origin B, for instance, on on different news agents as well. Yeah, OK, I see. Yeah. OK, yeah, Th thanks, Johan, for the question. So Peter Thatcher. I really like the use cases and the idea that we can do a better job of uh, local peer-to-peer -peer connections. I do think we need to figure out a good way to make this work with other APIs rather than being like a completely separate thing. Um, but I'd be happy to participate in the uh, discussion, design, et cetera. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. So uh, yeah, you, we know each other from the open screen protocol times. So happy to see you here. <laughs> Hopefully we get face to face in September. Um, uh, Florent Castelli. Yes, um, so one uh, quick comment first. Uh, the Data Intelligence API has been modeled after the WebSocket API, and uh, it's now a little bit different. I hope that we don't end up with three similar but yeah, APIs, but that are behaving just a little bit different in every case. So we'll need to make sure that uh, we can harmonize all of that. And if you have any good suggestion to improve the data general API, uh, I believe that we uh, we all like to uh, hear suggestions. Uh, second point: uh, Would this allow um, a connection between two different tabs in the same browser, one so that we can have a communication channel? That is exposed based on um, what capabilities I'm offering this service, and another tab can just connect to it. Yeah, indeed. So you have the ability to uh, basically um, advertise yourself uh, as one of these peers uh, and then uh, be able to find and connect to that. Uh, obviously, all of these um, require you to give permission um, uh, to go forward. And uh, the authentication step, at least currently, it requires you to do the pin uh, entry to validate that you're actually connecting to the peer that you expect to connect to um, as such. OK. Is there any stickiness to the permission in any way, or a way to get stickiness? Uh, potentially. I, I think this is the kind of the fringes of where we are with the spec now, but I, I feel like yeah, it might be uh, possible, yes. OK. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Harald. So uh, feeling a little bit sad about the approach because it seems to try to replace all the components at once, and uh, I don't quite see why. Uh, I mean, uh, WebRTC has traditionally been uh, transporting RTP packets, and uh, transporting RTP packets is a pretty well-known technology. And uh, I mean, we have the quick over RTP over quick thing, which is trying to put quick underneath that. But it feels like this should be a separate, separable components component rather than uh, than something that is uh, trying to replace everything at once. So uh, one 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 question I asked about uh, the stack you built. 
when you have OSP built on DNSSD, does that mean that you're limited to discovering resources within the same broadcast domain? Yeah, I think uh, right now, yes. Um, I think that's also kind of part of the use cases that we are going after. Uh, for example, people on the same uh, local network or you're connecting to your uh, TV, for example. Um, in those use cases, that would be fine. Um, yeah, I think it would be very interesting to explore if you could have something similar on the uh, broader scale, like um, across segments or even at the WAN level. But um, yeah, that's very much out of scope of what we're doing right now. We're focusing on um, the local network um, IoT adjacent use case. Mm, which also limits your exposure to hacks, hacks of course. Yes, and I want to comment also on your uh, reusability. This is absolutely what we are going for. We want to uh, be able to introduce the least amount of uh, new functionality possible to make this happen. I want to have basically uh, OCI layers uh, where we have the service discovery very separate. We have quick and we have RTP on top of that. I think that should all be uh, be possible. Um, yeah. I mean, if you if you were to drop the quick part and just say that you have a key exchange mechanism that gives you trusted keys without using uh, without using uh, using a negotiation through a server, and that would uh, be an even smaller change. It's an interesting thing to explore right now. We are we are using also the quick um, as transfer transport for um, the SPAC2 exchange. Um, but maybe there's a way to make that generic so that you could do it over any transport. That's, that's something that could be explored uh, potentially, yeah. So the way the way that uh, WebRTC currently is put together, uh, you're basically, the media part is basically using uh, uh, DTLS only as a key derivation mechanism. And then as a side effect, using it as a, as a, as as a transport for for the data channels, so uh, yes, I would uh, I would encourage you to see if you could pick up pick up a pick it into e even smaller pieces. Yeah, yeah, I appreciate the feedback, Harald. So we will record that. So I, to, asking the chairs how many minutes we have. We have two chairs well, on the queue. Probably so just you... one left, or uh, so we can All still right. give Peter his twenty. Yeah. All right. So Jan Ivar is next on queue. Yes, I, I would like to echo Harold's concern that it seems like a, a, a confluence of many small things, that, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, many of which are interesting. Like discovery, for instance, mm -hmm. if, if this can solve local discovery in a, with a permission prompt, it seems like you, that's all you need to bootstrap a WebRTC connection. You don't necessarily have to have uh, all these other pieces. Uh, but but if the goal is to use Quick and not WebRTC, then those are different. Uh, that would be a difference. So it depends on what we want to achieve here, I guess. Uh, as far as data channel, I don't think it's going anywhere because, um, and when we're talking about similar protocols, I think we need to differentiate between uh, web developer ergonomics, mm -hmm. in which case I think very much like data channel was modeled on WebSocket. It didn't need to have any other spec reference or anything like that. It's just a way of building it to be similarly um, accessible and look the same. But I think the devil is always in the details. And I think if you look at any of these APIs, data channel, WebSocket, uh, like you obviously can't use a data channel to talk to a WebSocket server. So the ergonomics are, the, the similarities are superficial if we're just interested in ergonomics. And also web transport right now in its charter is limited to client server. Even though I know Peter's opened an issue to uh, to look at peer-to-peer uh, -peer there, so um, a lot of things to pick from here, and a lot of it is interesting. But also, uh, as a unified uh, model, I'm not. It's still unclear to me where we want to go here. Okay, so I think our time is up, but my suggestion would be, uh, and see that maybe uh, we think about what to do for TPAC. Um, yes. Yeah, so Sounds, and, great. Uh, Sounds great. Maybe uh, anyone in the working group is interested in working with ANSI. I, I'm interested too. Should uh, take that up and try to figure out where you know what what should happen at TPAC. Um, yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And try I, to I, try to come up with something for that. Yeah, thank you. I want to just 
Correct. This is a community effort, so I, I, I don't claim any any bigger pie of this. So Mikiel has been instrumental in driving this along with other contributors. So, mm -hmm. so we're working on this together and we actually welcome new contributors. So so if you're interested, if you know people outside this call who would be interested, please point them to these places. Here are the repos and, and uh, let's, let's keep uh, exploring this space together. Thank you for your time and attention. You're welcome. And great questions. Yeah. All right, Peter. We're we're getting to you late, but hopefully there's still time for you to uh, have a decent uh, presentation. <laughs> wow, I'm gonna have to go fast. All right, RTP transport. You probably forgot all about it, but we're still working on it. We've been making a lot of progress at the GitHub repository. Just a reminder: the last time we talked about it, everyone was on board with the piecemeal approach, and that approach is what we've made progress on in the GitHub repository. So we've broken up the GitHub repository into two use cases or two explainers, the one we call use case one and the one we call use case two. Today, I'm going to be talking about use case one, but I will have a note at the end about use case two. I'll go really fast. Use case one allows you to do, next slide, custom header extensions, custom encoding, decoding, pactization, depactization, and as a almost a side effect, you can also do a custom jitter buffer and FEC and bitrate allocation. So onto the examples. Uh, sorry, this got a little jumbled in the copy and paste, but basically uh, you can send a customized header extension in the sense that you can change the value, for example, with uh, an audio level by capturing the packet before it gets sent, altering it, and then sending it. No, it's okay, it's okay, just, just keep going. We, we gotta go fast, all right. But if you also wanted to send a header extension that is not baked into the browser. It's not well known, but it, you know it's something you made up or something being standardized in the ITF or whatever. Then you can add a header extension. Uh, again, you get the packet before it's sent. You modify it and then you send it. Uh, next slide. Sorry, this is going fast, but we were limited on time. Um, on the receive end, you can get the packet that's coming in and process the header extension. So just reading the packet as it comes in. Next slide. As far as encoding, you can do it one of two ways, either with WASM or web codecs or I don't know, whatever else comes in the future. But basically it's up to the JavaScript to decide how to encode or decode or packetize or depacketize. In this example, uh, it basically can take uh, video, encode it, packetize it, and then send it because it can send really anything it wants. And, and in this case, it's doing its own thing with the source of the video and the encoding of the video because it's all in Wasm. Uh, next slide. There is one way that's interesting. Uh, oh, sorry, that's the next slide. Uh, on the receive end, you would all you could implement your own jitter buffer in order to do the decode and do the decode in Wasm. So that's what this example is here. And these are all in the explainer, by the way, on GitHub. If you want to go spend more time reading them. Okay. Uh, next slide. Um, while making these slides, I thought of an interesting approach that you could do with audio, where you could continue to use the audio jitter buffer built into WebRTC by basically, when you decode, you then uh, kind of repacketize into a packet that WebRTC expects using the L16 um, payload format, and then it'll go ahead and continue using the jitter buffer and rendering. So you don't, in a very piecemeal approach, you can do your own codec without re-implementing your own jitter buffer. At least I think that would work. That's an idea I just threw on there. Uh, but I did add to the GitHub repository too. Next uh, slide as an example. So if you wanted to use web codecs, uh, here's how you would do it. It looks very similar, except here uh, we're calling new video encoder as it happens with web codecs. And you take the output and you packetize it yourself. That's the, the blue means like code you would cut, you would write yourself as custom. Um, and then you would send it using the uh, RTP transport. Next slide. Um, this is demonstrating how you could take the uh, information about the bandwidth estimation and bitrate allocation from RTP transport and use it to do rate control on the encoder. Next slide. If you wanted to implement your own jitter buffer, but use Web codecs for the decode. This is how it would look. It's very similar to if you did it with WASM, except using web codecs, where you get the packets that are coming out, you put them in a jitter buffer, then at the appropriate time when the frames are assembled, you run decode and then render. Next slide. 
And in a similar way, you could uh, use web codecs to use that uh, trick I was talking about with L16 to continue using the audio jitterbug for built into the browser, but use web codecs for the decode if you wanted to do that. Uh, I'm not actually sure why you would want to do that, but maybe there's some reason. Next slide. So uh, the big question we have at the moment in our discussion on GitHub uh, is about workers. What we don't have resolved is how we should integrate with workers. And this might overlap with the discussion that was happening earlier about audio worklets. Um, but basically, the idea is uh, should be require, or the question is should we require workers or just have it be optional? Should it be a transferable mechanism or should it be a dedicated worker mechanism? Or maybe should it, in the case of audio, should it be an audio worklet mechanism? So this is an unresolved question. Next slide. Uh, if you'd like to see these examples in detail and spend time reading them or see other examples about custom FEC or custom bitrate allocation, they are at that link at the GitHub repository. And if you're interested in use case two, which is about customizing congestion control, bandwidth estimation, and probing and pacing, then you can also take a look at that link. I've only covered use case one here today. Uh, next slide. Okay, so feedback. We're looking for feedback. Uh, one question would be, are all of your use cases covered? Uh, and if not, you can go ahead and file an issue at the GitHub repository. Another one is if you would like to comment on the question of workers, there's a specific issue for that, issue 33. Uh, if you're interested in commenting on the shape of the API, maybe you saw something, you're like, what the heck is that? Some of it is there so that we can maintain performance, uh, but there's a discussion going on about that on issue 20. Uh, and if you have any other thoughts or ideas, uh, there's just go ahead and file an issue. There's a lot of discussion and progress being made at the GitHub repository. Um, so I think the next slide says discussion. Yes. All right. Now we can discuss things here <laughs> with one minute. I don't know how much time we have. We can we can give you a little to maybe go to nine fifty five. Okay. So we got six, six minutes for discussion. So I had a question. Um, the use case one, it's kind of custom packetization and you described all the stuff you can do. And I think it's true, but I'd like to hear your thoughts on it, that with respect to the Weber to see extended use cases, that use case one covers every all four of those. Uh, do you think that's true? Like, um, for example, for video conferencing, there, there's a bunch of audio stuff that people want to do, like in WASM. I think it covers that. Uh, for the game streaming things, there's um, inclu including some of the VR gaming. Uh, there's custom header extensions, and so you can packetize things, you know, as you want. So I think it covers a bunch of those. Um, I don't know about the low latency broadcast with fan out. Perhaps Harold can describe whether there's any value for that use case. Um, but is that how you see it, Peter? That it, it covers these kind of ever most of the things that are in these four um, yes it, it 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 certainly helps with all four of those um what's not included is things like customizing uh mac and rtx although i right. guess you could still do something there just not in as much of a piecemeal approach um and also if you want if any of those included doing custom uh congestion control or bandwidth estimation things that would fall under the second explainer but in general yes the first explainer covers a lot of what's going on with those WebRTC extended use cases. Thanks. I don't know who's next. You in? Uh, I think I'm next. Yeah. Uh, so yes, I, I like that we focus on custom packetization. Um, and, and for the side, though, I feel like if you're allowing custom packetization, like changing packets, then uh, probably people will start sending packets through that. So we probably need like the definition of uh, a packet source somehow, because otherwise it's uh, it's a bit clumsy. You see packets, a lot of packets flowing, but nothing is being actually sent in terms of audio or video frames, and everything is is like the stats. Everything is odd. So maybe the concept of a, a packet-based source, like the the new encoded video frame uh, proposal that we have as well uh, could could fall into that i really like the piecemeal approach because there are use cases where you want to change packets so it's uh, a, it's it's really great to to see that happening 
And um, for the uh, discussion between worker or not worker, I think that the first discussion that we need to to discuss is whether we want to transfer dynamically or not. That's the first case because worker or not, that's somehow different because you can uh, you might want to say, okay, something is happening in a window, and then you transfer to a worker, and then you transfer to another worker, or you can say something is either happening in the window or in a worker, and it will remain there. And that's the first question. So the first Just question, a question is really for you, or not. Do you ever see a, a use case for dynamic transfer? Like I see no uh, no use case for that, and I see complexity. I implemented media stream track transferring. I implemented data channel transferring, and these objects uh, for data channel we restricted to uh, to transfer it at a very specific time to limit the complexity, and it's good enough. And if we if we were, if we would have been able to design differently to say, please create the data channel there, it would have been simpler in, in terms of the implementation, and I would, I yeah. would have preferred that. So yeah, that, that's why only... I think we, yeah, we really need to decide that. And my guess is that a fixed place is uh, solving like all cases or in most cases, and uh, is simpler. So, yeah. Harold? Yeah, so uh, on the question of uh, whether this actually deals well with low latency broadcast with fan out, as Guido said in, uh, in um, a discussion on this, um, if you're dealing with frame level, if you have to know whether, you, whether or not you have a whole frame before you do anything, then the frame level uh, API is actually more convenient to work with. And besides, we have it implemented. Uh, but uh, some of these use cases are interesting. One of the scary things is that you basically remove all guarantees of uh, the stuff that is being uh, asked to put on a wire, and that it should be consistent with anything. Because if you can send bytes, you can send bytes. So that uh, the the browser needs to be hardened on both ends to basically receive anything. Of course, the channel is encrypted, and uh, the user the the client still doesn't have the encryption keys. So we're still safe against the the on the wire attacks. But uh, it's kind of important what you're still what you're still not supposed to do and that's a long uh, list of things that we have to have to work out in details too long to present in this in this meeting but uh, still i think we're getting somewhere and that's good yeah i mean you could definitely write a codec fuzzer using this <laughs> all right it's uh oh Anywhere. So, I was going to say it's 10 feet track, yeah. but. Yeah, but I'll, I'll go quick. I, I, I'm still concerned. This feels like an escape hatch a little bit. And uh, um, if we look at, uh, to echo what Hal said about security here, I think we ran into a lot of the same things in web transport, where a lot of the security properties come from uh, relying on fetch and the existing infrastructure for port blocking, for congestion control and the security model of the, of the web browser that I would love to not repeat. Um, if we, so I'm a bit concerned that this, I, I like, I, I see nothing wrong with the use cases, but I'm not sure that this, I think having this low level of an API seems like a redo a little bit. And I was hoping that maybe we could integrate solutions for this using our existing tech more and um, wondering if, and also, API-wise, just to, to nitpick a little bit on send RTP packet. Uh, in web transport, we have a writable stream for even for datagrams, which seem like in a similarly low-level API where we use streams. So I'm curious why. Uh, I think you had streams in an earlier proposal, and I see you don't have those now. Yeah, just unfortunately, I don't. I don't think we're yeah, trying to delve into the what WG streams topic, but go ahead, Ewan. Uh, 
Yeah, I just wanted to mention that uh, I agree with Harold, and I, I had the same concern when we added Encoded Transform, because Encoded Transform allowed to fully control uh, the Encoded form. So basically, you were able to uh, to do the uh, and to do the decoder fuzzing there, and uh, I was a bit surprised that we did not do too bad there. So that's why I, I, I'm not excessively confident because there it's we are opening it uh, in a in a in a larger way. But still, I, I think that uh, we we have done okay with Encoded Transform. So there we we, we still have some. I uh, hope that it's, it, it, it could fly. Yeah, the uh, WebRTC decoder and encoder is a little bit more hardened than web codecs where we're still having zero days. <laughs> okay, well, 10.57, thanks for your input. I made some notes. Yeah, so I think the plan is to try to keep refining the use case. We've been taking out some stuff from the API that isn't needed. I think based on Harold's feedback, maybe the low latency broadcast with fan out use case doesn't belong in here, um, but but maybe there's something else that does. Um, are there any next steps we should write down before we run out of time? Uh, things to do, for example, for, for TPAC or a next session? You mean in general, not just about RTP transport, right? Uh, well, in general, we should do that too, but also about RTP transport if there's, uh, yeah, I think this will also be a TPAC topic. Is that right? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I'm just curious, like uh, particularly Yanni Ivar, if there's things you'd like to see done that should be on the next steps list. Yeah, I, I'm not sure uh, what next steps are in this case. Uh, I'd like to get Randall's input. How we okay. feel about maybe the that's the next step. <laughs> maybe. Okay. Are there other any other next steps to discuss? I think we talked about the peer-to-peer -peer API. Maybe that's a TPAC topic. This is a TPAC topic, uh, and I think we have next steps for everything else. So I think we're about done for today. And uh, we'll be back in June and July, as we've discussed. And I guess we'll see everybody on GitHub in the meantime. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. See you later.